Closed captioning of This Week in Northern California is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. The presidential candidates get back to the campaign trail after their first debate, with Governor Romney picking up some momentum. President Obama returned to the Golden State this weekend. There's high interest in several congressional races in the state. Will California tip the scales for the control of the U.S. House? Governor Brown vetoes few of the more than 1,800 bills on his desk as he presses for support of Proposition 30 on the November ballot. And gas jumped as much as 20 cents overnight, with the spike expected to continue. Plus, anti-domestic violence leader Esther Sola on making all violence an issue of global concern. Coming up next. Good evening, I'm Belva Davis and welcome to This Week in Northern California. On our news panel tonight, Dan Walters, political columnist for the Sacramento Bee, joins us from the state capitol. In studio, we have Tom Vagar, consumer editor for KTVU News, and Josh Richmond, regional political reporter for the Bay Area News Group, and Joe Garofoli, political reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle. Well, Joe, you were in Denver for the mm -hmm. first presidential debate. Mm -hmm. uh, must have been hard covering it since there were so many people tweeting that night. That's but tell <laughs> us just what has happened since then. How are the candidates uh, Th Things responding. have really evolved over the last 48 hours since the debate. You have, uh, it was widely perceived that the president did not have a good night. Mm -hmm. Came out a little sleepy. Didn't really realize that the debate is also a show. It's not just a, a, a competition of ideas. But in the remaining, in the intervening 48 hours, there's been a lot of fact checking and some of the stuff that Romney has said, and that's catching up to him. And the job numbers have come out today, and those have been help, will be helpful to the president a little bit. They, the unemployment rate dropped to 7.8 percent, first the lowest it's been since he's been president, and that helps definitely uh, because the Republicans have been saying for the last three years uh, unemployment rate has been has been high and, and, and not dropping below 8 percent. So this is a sort of a, a symbolic victory. It's not going to move any voters, mm -hmm. but it's a symbolic victory for the president. Well, how was it covering it in this new era of uh, instant messaging for a reporter right. who's trying to get to the real news there? Well, you have, you have uh, there's something uh, after a debate called Spin Alley, and that's where all the folks, uh, the, the, the operatives from the campaign will try and you know, spin you, that no matter what happens in the debate, they say, oh, my candidate won, he was tremendous. Mm -hmm. But right now, you know, with social media, people are watching the debate, uh, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and they're, they're forming their own narrative there. They're, they're commenting. And now uh, there's a study that came out today that said the impressions of people on Facebook and Twitter were much more positive about the president than it was in the sort of the traditional media uh, painted the, the portrait of the debate. Still, it sort of seemed like Mitt Romney had, had cornered the market on Red Bulls there and maybe the president hadn't had enough. Oh, yes. And yes. that he wasn't doing what, what he often does best, which is sort of connect with people in some semi-Clintonian sort of way. Right. Is there an opportunity for him to do that further down the line? Oh, and absolutely. He has to the next time. He left yeah. a lot of stuff on the table. He didn't, didn't mention the 47% bomb. He didn't talk about women's issues. He didn't, he didn't push back on Romney on a lot of the stuff that he was pounding him on, even the stuff that was factually inaccurate. The president didn't call him out on stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a, a lot of the partisans, uh, Obama's supporters, are very disappointed in his performance. Mm -hmm. And and he's going to have some ground to come up. It, it put Romney back in play. Let me ask you this. What was the feeling like in the room? You know, we saw what was going on on the stage, but you really didn't get a sense of what was going on. Was, was there a palpable feeling in the room that things were going well or not well? Or I mean, what was that like? Well, the dirty little secret of covering uh, a presidential debate is that you are not in the room. Reporters are not in the room. We're in like a, a barn, you know, or a gym actually, uh, uh, you know, short and nearby. Um, but there was definitely a feeling afterwards, you know, of, you know, what happened. You know, what, there was a surprising performance, that prefer, the, and it is a performance uh, at some level. Um, 
the uh, the spin meisters from you know the Demo Axelrod and, and all those guys, the president's advisors, they they stayed in and answered the questions, but then they got out of there quickly. Um, the Republicans, they, they could have stayed there all night. The, the, the Romney supporters, they wanted to talk about this. They wanted to gloat about this all night. Well, some critics said the president spent so much time stating what Romney believed, but he never told us as much as he should have about what he believed. Yeah, he was almost like too much of the nice guy thing. He was saying, oh, uh, Governor Romney and I agree on this. Governor, and, and, he, and he, you wanted to paint differences. If you're, if you're running for the, the highest office in the land, you want to say how you're different from your opponent, and the president didn't do a good job of differentiating himself. Romney did. You know, in the theatrics of the debate, he was very appointed, he was concise, and he, it's something he hasn't been uh, throughout the campaign. Well, quickly, he'll be here on what day? Uh, he'll be here on the Monday, President, grabbing cash. <laughs> hey, not uh, he'll be having a semi-public yeah. event, but he'll and be here for a fundraiser. And then the VP debate. When is that? The vet vice president uh, on Thursday, which is must-see TV, Belva. That uh. is going to be chaotic <laughs> television. You have to t set the v the DVR now. <laughs> okay, so that's what's happening at the top of the ticket. Now we'll move to those areas down where there's lots of action as the Democrats try to take back the. House, Josh. Exactly. Well, worries. you know, I, it, it's hard to get excited sometimes about the presidential election here in California, where it sort of feels like a foregone conclusion as to, to how the Golden State's going to go. But the, this state is home to 11 House districts that are considered either competitive or close to competitive, uh, and that's in the in the in the scheme of of uh, the Democrats needing 25 seats if they're going to retake. The House of Representatives, and and perhaps reinstall Nancy Pelosi as uh, as Speaker of the House. And some of those races are, are right here in Northern California. You've got uh, w one of the very closest races in the state. Actually, is where uh, uh, incumbent Republican Dan Lundgren is being taken on for the second time by Ami Berra, who's a physician from from Elk Grove. And uh, the the voter registration has changed in that district uh, due to redistricting and and due to some very intensive voter registration drive on behalf of the Democrats. They actually now have a a one percentage point lead in voter registration, which of course means that it's it's neck and neck. It's very close. There's been a lot of money dumped into this and other races by outside interests all over the country. The Chamber of Commerce. Uh, just last week launched a, a $2.8 million ad blitz that, that's supposed to help buoy uh, eight Republican House candidates across the state, including Lundgren. Uh, also here in Northern California, we've got incumbent Democrats, uh, John Garamendi and Jerry McNerney, who are trying to hold off Republican challenges. Those aren't quite such close races. They're leaning or likely Democrat races, but still in play, certainly. Well, there's sp supposed to have been a hot race between uh, down uh, with the Valley, the new districts mm -hmm. with McNerney and uh, with Ricky Gill. Is that turning out to be a real race well, or not? Well, it, it's it, the Cook Political Report, which has a really good grasp on these things, is is. Ca is has that listed as a leaning Democratic race right now, which is not so far as likely Democratic, but it's not considered a toss-up either. Can I, uh, uh, can I interject a little something here? Absolutely. Please, uh, you know, they start out this year with uh, Nancy Pelosi and other Democrats thinking that, I think she actually said, the pathway to a majority is in California. Mm -hmm. They talked about picking up eight seats, that sort of thing. That's gone by the board now. Really, they did some really miscues. They didn't get their candidates nominated in a couple of districts, one district in which two Republicans are now running against each other. And the, the feeling among the uh, handicappers now is that Democrats would be lucky to come out with two, three, four seats in California. And that forms the core of the consensus now among the handicappers in Washington that the Democrats have very, very little chance of taking back control because they're doing so poorly in California. It, it's definitely a long shot. And we, we carried a story recently about whether the, the top of the ticket, the Romney-Obama uh, race, was really having any effect on how people look at these congressional candidates. And the answer generally was that it doesn't, uh, even when Romney was having a, a bad couple of weeks, because... Uh, you know, there's no effective Romney campaign here in California. These Republicans get to sort of run their own campaigns in their own districts without a lot of uh, of national drag. Um, that said, you know the, the the two tightest races, you know Lundgren up here and B Brian Bilbray down in in uh, San Diego. Uh, uh, some other races, uh, an open seat where uh, um, uh, Julia Brownlee, the Democrat, is up against Republican Tony Strickland. These are important. Uh, you know, it, it is a, a very long, long shot for the Democrats to do it. Well, but if they lose those seats, it ain't going to happen at all. Is right, so. outside money a factor 
Oh, it's whether, huge. Dan, I, don't want, I would like you to chime in yeah, on that. Huge, lots of big having... money. You mentioned the $2.8 million the Chamber's paying. Listen, the, the airwaves in Sacramento are saturated with Lundgren and Barra ads and all, quite a few also for uh, Ricky Gill mm -hmm. and McNerney and Garamendi and Van. I mean, this is hot stuff going on here. There's a lot of outside money. But I, want, I, think there's a, I think there's a place where the presidential thing does affect these congressional races, and that's in turnout. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to see the kind of turnout this year that we saw four years ago, and that could hurt the Democrats. There's really nothing driving voter turnout in California. There's nothing going on at the presidential level. There's no U.S. Senate seats seriously at stake. There's really nothing out there to get that kind of visceral reaction and get a big turnout. And if the turnout's substantially lower than it was four years ago, that will hurt the Democrats. We sort, we sort of grabbed your story a bit here. That's okay. That's <laughs> okay. fine. Do you agree that outside money is having an influence? It absolutely is. You know, whether it's the uh, partisan super PACs or business or whatever, there's a lot of money being spent here, which I, I guess is uh, very good for political consultants in California. Yes. Well, we'll turn to Dan Walters now <laughs> there in Sacramento. Invite you in to talk this time about the governor, Dan, and and uh, what what is it a balancing act? Some people are saying that he's that he has uh, been trying to do in order to get Proposition 30, the tax measure that he wants very badly to win in November. Uh, so how did he balance his act? Well, as you might recall, uh, many years ago, Jerry Brown expostulated the canoe theory of politics. You paddle on the left, you paddle on the right, and you more or less go down the middle in a kind of an erratic sort of way. And that's how he was uh, approached the legislation that reached his desk this year. He, he, he paddled a little on the left, he paddled a little on the right. He gave the interest groups, the Democratic Party interest groups, a little something here, a little something there, but he didn't give them everything they wanted. And I think really what was underlying all of this is not just a, a centrism per se, but he didn't want to rock the boat. He didn't want to have anything that he signed come back to become, have kind of reverberation to echo and to maybe alienate significant blocks of voters that, that might look poorly on him, might look poorly on the capital, on the legislature. In fact, he was saving the legislature from itself in many ways because what he really mm -hmm. wants to happen is the voters to pass Proposition 30, his tax increase, and anything that would cause great controversy and perhaps damage his image damages Proposition 30. So he, did, he wanted no drama. He wanted to keep it quiet, and he did. He, he vetoed the most controversial things that could have uh, and generated a lot of, uh, uh, of angst afterwards, such as making California a sanctuary state for illegal immigrants and, and things like that. Things that would have stirred up the population. He didn't want to do that, and he wanted to keep a lid on everything, and he succeeded in that. Yeah, Dan, I have a question uh, for you. Is, is there anything that, that the governor can do, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but by executive order, say, as sort of a last minute pander to get people to come out for Prop 30. And I'm thinking gas prices. Could, is there anything that he could do by executive order to do something about gas prices in California? And, you know, he, you know, he tried, to. there was a gas price spike uh, 35 years ago or so while he was governor, and he tried to exploit that, and it just backfired on him very badly. And I, I kind of doubt. I do think, however, this, and you, you raise a very valid point in this sense, if voters feel bad about their economic situation, they're less likely to vote for tax, and not only taxes, but there's a, there are over a hundred local bond issues on the ballot in California this year, and dozens of local tax measures. If they feel like they're getting squeezed economically, I think that they'll be less inclined to vote for taxes at the state level and at the local level, well, and bonds. And I think that's where it could come out and bite. Dan, I want to ask you this. What about the demeanor of the man? Is he thinking about the potential of losing this? He must be thinking about that. And what's that doing to his demeanor and just his whole attitude towards this whole thing? I mean, I know he's, he's going for Prop 30, but, but is he prepared to not win it? Well, I suppose he is. I mean, he says he is. He says he's basically, he'll, he'll follow the will of the people. I think the Jerry Brown that's here now uh, is a lot different in many ways than the Jerry Brown that I saw 30, 35 years ago when we were both much younger. Uh, he is uh, much more, he, I don't think he's changed in the inside very much, but I think his demeanor has changed and he's much more 
uh, cautious, less willing to go out on a limb, very kind of uh, almost uh, uh, risk averse in many respects. And that's a, new, that's a kind of a new Jerry Brown, and, and it's, it's, it's not as, as interesting as Jerry Brown, I might say, but I think he is prepared to lose. I mean, he has a kind of this kind of Jesuitical, fatalistic sort of view about things anyway. It's like, you know, what happens happens, and you deal with it when it happens. I do think, though, that if he loses this thing, it does raise a question as to whether he would run for another term because he would just be presiding but, over but Dan, years of deficits and budgets. But Dan, what about the state? What shape will this state be in if he loses? Because this is all about services to people. Well, I think they'll be a, in a big pickle. I mean, they're going to be in a situation unless the economy picks up very dramatically and, and there are absolutely no signs that California is going to come see another boom anytime soon. Then what you're dealing with here is basically a state budget that is anywhere between 10 and 15 percent out of whack, that the revenues are 10 to 15 percent below their supposed spending commitments. And that's going to be very, very painful. You're going to see it, it for, in a lot of things. Uh, but, you know, there, it's, on the other hand, and there's always another hand in politics, if he's successful and gets this thing passed, he also runs the risk of a, of a kind of a volatility. He's asked, he's basically betting the state's future on a handful, basically 150,000 California taxpayers out of 38 million people, that they're going to do well enough to raise all this money that he thinks he's going to have coming from this ballot measure. That's a little bit scary too, particularly since it also guarantees local governments $5 billion a year for realignment. He's made a, a constitutional spending commitment on a temporary tax. That's well, kind of that's kind of uncertain as well. We have so many hot issues. We have to move to one that is really hot because it's burning the pocketbooks of the people of the state, and that's gas prices that seem to be gone a bit wild. Went uh, to a record price in San Francisco today. Probably will around the state by tomorrow. Uh, the average price in the Bay Area is four dollars and fifty-five cents. That is sixteen cents more than yesterday. Thirty-seven cents more than a week ago, and seventy cents higher than a year ago. So it is a huge problem for the state of California. There are six primary factors that are contributing to this, and they are very important. One is the Chevron refinery. That's one out of eight gallons of fuel in the state of California. That's out of service for many months to come. There was a major um, pipeline that Chevron owns and operates that has been shut down since the middle of September, out of service. That denies the amount of crude oil coming into the refineries, cutting down on supply. Uh, there was a fire in Southern California at an Exxon refinery, and it wasn't a fire, it was a, a, a power loss, but the power loss had put it down pretty much for two days, and only now is it beginning to get back online. There's planned maintenance uh, shutdowns that are coming to, so that you can switch over to this uh, fuel that uh, is known as the winter blend of fuel as opposed to the summer blends. And then when you actually start doing that, there's a further diminution until you get that up into uh, speed. And then finally, you have an improving economy where hopefully more people will be using more fuel and so the speculators are bidding up the price. All of that is coming to uh, this uh, kind of Armageddon that we're seeing that if you just lose a few percent of the fuel here in the state of California, prices spike out of sight now to new records. Well, um, <laughs> the, the governor, as, as Dan has already told us, can't use that to help get his tax measure passed. Well, I'll tell you, here's what's interesting. Uh, there is a, a short-term solution is a real one, and that is there are places in the world that brew this gas. There's up in the state of Washington, in the Caribbean, in Houston, and even in Europe, they can brew this gas. But if they brew this gas, which is CARB gas, California Air Resources Board gas, a very special gas for California, they can bring that gas here, but it's going to take two or three weeks at best because they're going to put it on ships. The one thing they can do, and it has been authorized one time, is they actually can waive for a short period of time carb gas and say you can bring gas in from anywhere. Now there's a slight penalty you pay for the pollution that it creates, but that penalty is so insignificant to the amount of money that would be cut from the cost of gas because once you get those few percent in, then you have a normal gas market, prices would fall instantaneously. There's no evidence that anybody's going to allow that to happen, but it has been approved once, and if we do that, we could see prices go away very, very quickly. Well, well maybe this is something the governor hasn't thought of. Uh, I think the governor is... Favor uh, no, I think the governor is well aware of this. The question is, do you want to just kind to suspend some of the environmental rules which have been hard fought for and hard built on in order to do this. Politically, it would be very favorable to do that, but then he would have the environmental community saying this is a crazy way to stabilize a market. The way to stabilize the market is to get these things up and running, and that shouldn't take all that long. 
but we could be seeing this gasoline problem stay with us for a matter of a few days to a few months, depending on how these uh, various uh, entities, the refineries and the pipelines actually go. And the overall impact on the economy? Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's right. Well, the overall impact on the economy in the short term is almost nothing. You know, in two or three weeks, you might buy a tank or two of gasoline. But if we're talking about several months, now we're talking about several tanks of gasoline, that affects the mind of consumers, and then they don't go to the theater, they don't go to the restaurant, and that will have a big impact on California. It is all time dependent. Uh -huh. Time dependent. Last issue. <laughs> Joe, did what did you say the price was uh, in, in Colorado? It was, it was like three eighty seven. It was a buck. <laughs> I, I came home and I and I filled my tank up uh, because a certain other person in my family did not fill the tank. Can't afford to drive. And to I, Colorado. It was a buck more. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us here tonight. Time just whizzed by. So good to have you. Well, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. My next guest, Esther Sola, has been a leader in the international movement to prevent violence against women and children and was recently honored by the San Francisco Domestic Violence Consortium for her work. I spoke with Esther Sola earlier. Well, first of all, congratulations on Thank your you. many awards and honors, but you just got a Lifetime Achievement one. You were the, the founder of, uh, and also, I, I'd say, the mother of uh -huh. the awareness of people mm -hmm. of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. uh, lately, we he we've heard so much about it because of the one family, our, our mm -hmm. elected sheriff's family. Mm -hmm. But give us a little bit of background. Well, let's go back 30 years, because okay. I think our first conversation <laughs> was over 30 years ago. And, and um, we started uh, actually as a national project in San Francisco, uh, mm -hmm. uh, working in the DA's office and at General Hospital. And, um, and nobody actually would return our calls. So mm -hmm. at the time when we started, let me just say that it was a very private problem. It was hidden. Um, it was filled in the shroud of shame. The turning point um, was uh, these wonderful programs in communities that started at kitchens um, and people started hearing about people in trouble and they said, I want to do something about it. And from that, we were able to get Congress in 1984 to pass the first piece of legislation called the Family Violence Prevention and Services mm -hmm. Act. We went from the 80s when there wasn't a whole lot of attention, but there was a lot of good work being done in the communities um, to where we are now. Your very name, Future Without Violence, right. says how global that you're thinking. Correct. So let's talk about what are you doing in today's world. Correct. So um, a part of what we've been doing um, in the last uh, period of time is trying to get the violence against Against Women Act in this country reauthorized, um, and you know that that has been a challenge. Um, we will continue that fight. It's really, really important that the work that's been done continue. We have, over the last, I'd say, 20 years, when we started collecting data, been able to reduce the level of violence against adult women, domestic violence, by over 53%. Do you think it's because of the mindset or because of the legislation? I think there's norm change. I think there are community programs where people can go and get help. Um, I think laws have changed, and I think they're being enforced. And I think that makes a difference. People would say to me, I mean, violence is just intractable. Violence is just part of the human experience and human condition. And I said, no, it's not. We've changed the law, we've created these programs, we've put things in place, and it is working. I mean, we're standing with doctors and nurses and um, police officers and community activists this across the country. This is a global problem, so you have a Correct. global base. We've been working uh, for many, many years to not only let people know that violence against women and kids is a big problem in the United States, but it's a big problem around the world. And we had a chance during the Beijing conference in 1995 to put the issue of violence in the platform of action. When Secretary of State Clinton gave her speech in Beijing, she said, women's rights are human rights, but if they're being beaten and abused, they're never going to actualize it. You have a current campaign mm -hmm. where you're really trying to mm -hmm. uh, get to teenagers, and it, the word respect is in it, and mm -hmm. how does that play out with these young people? Part of what we're trying to do is get people to really have a conversation about healthy relationships, and healthy relationships are based on mutual respect. Um, so respect is fundamental to any relationship that has open communication, empathy, and is not filled with control and battery. 
Do you get team buy-in to these we campaigns when you announce do. them? We absolutely do. We absolutely do. I mean, we had a wonderful teen summit uh, in Boston where we had hundreds of teenagers facing it and not Facebooking it and having a conversation about if they're going to break up with somebody, they're going to do it in person and they're not going to just put it on the internet. Um, so we're working on it and uh, we are finding that most people want to do the right thing. Most young people want to do the right thing. And young people are still listening to their teachers, their coaches their parents um, in many in many communities and we're working with them as well to ask you finally about yes. the Ross Mercury trial yes. uh, that got lots of publicity did yes. it do anything you think to um, explain the mm -hmm. domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, situation in homes so that people better understand uh, what well, it is I it did. I, I think the community rallied um, to make sure that anybody who was in a situation where domestic violence was present, that the local community said, we're here. If you need help, please call us. I think the media talked about it a lot and revisited the issue about how important it is to stop and interrupt domestic violence and how it's really critical that if children are involved that they're exposed to this kind of violence and it's important to get help and to get help early. Okay, thank you very much, Esther, so for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Well, before we go, we want to congratulate Carla Marinucci, senior political writer for the San Francisco Chronicle and a regular contributor to this program who was honored with the Career Achievement Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. Visit us at kqed.org slash this week to find the online guide to the 2012 state ballot measures. And finally, a program note, be sure to tune in tonight at 9 for the premiere of Soundtracks, Music Without Borders, the program ventures across the globe in search of unique stories that show how music is changing the world. It's a co-production of KQED and Talbot Players. I'm Belva Davis. Thank you for watching. Good night.